Um, hello, everybody. My name is Isabel Singer. I am an exhibit developer at Lucy Creative. I'm also the um, steering committee chairperson or chief nudge of the Chicago Museum Exhibitors Group. And I'm really excited to have all of you guys here today. Um, just some housekeeping. Uh, we will be monitoring the chat for, um, for questions. Martin is going to be monitoring that. And if something comes up that's particularly related to what we're talking about at that moment, he'll, he'll chime in with your question. But otherwise, we will have some time for Q&A at the end. And we're going to probably spend about a half hour chatting between me and Carly and Paula mostly Carly and Paula, and then we will take questions. Uh, and so without further ado, um, I would like to invite Carly and Paula to introduce themselves. Uh, Paula, do you want to start? Yeah, I'll start. I think Carly's uh, trying to get in, so oh. I'll buy her some time. <laughs> Uh, so my name is Paula Santos. I am currently the Senior Manager of Learning and Engagement at Intuit, the Center for Intuitive and Outsider Art here in Chicago. Um, I have been a museum educator for like since 2007, uh, so a long time. Um, and I have been in Chicago for about five years at the National Museum of Mexican Art. Um, previously to Intuit, um, and I am no stranger to online engagement through my own personal projects. I have a podcast, uh, but that is a whole different uh, beast from institutional digital engagement. Thank you so much, Paula. And I we're just uh, we're just trying to figure out the logistics of. Um, of getting Carly into the call. Um, but while we're doing that, do you want to tell us a little bit about what the digital engagement at Intuit looked like before the shelter in place order and then also what it's looking like now? Yeah, so before um, we all started sheltering in place, um, Intuit definitely has had a robust presence on social, uh, primarily Instagram and Facebook and some Twitter, um, and also Intuit developed many, many teacher lessons uh, that had been shared. Uh, one of them was uh, the Henry Darger kit, and then they were set to, or we were set to um, have another one. Uh, based on the show that the Terra supported, Chicago Calling. Now, all of these things were sort of in the works because of a website transition. And there are probably so many of you on this call that have had to transition your websites and know that that is a huge process with things that get kind of uh, prioritized um, over others. So. I arrived in January of this year, and that was as far as we went with like quote unquote digital engagement. I mean, we have been so focused on uh, teacher programs, school programs, youth programs. So having hi Leo, hi Paul, hey. Paul having when I think someone's not muted. Having to move online was completely something that we had to just rethink the way we were going to do education and engagement, like period. Um, and, you know, I have been at other institutions where there already were digital components, whether it was uh, educator resources or maybe like cool technology labs that were doing stuff, but that was definitely not the case at Intuit. Um, I want to share a slide here um, so I can show you um, what our thinking was. So let me show you this slide. Oh, okay. Can you see that, Isabel? 
So uh, as soon as our doors closed, um, myself, um, our curator, Allison Amit, and our marketing manager, Annalie Wetzel, uh, convened to create this uh, digital engagement task force. Um, the top two areas where we just leaned into our strengths were, of course, social media um, and the learning resources that we had already been developing. So first, it was a far more concerted effort to do daily audience engagement across accounts and a more collaborative project in terms of what are the um, artworks, what is the tone that our social should take. Um, we didn't want to be uh, just kind of business as usual. We wanted to acknowledge that people were going through several phases of perhaps loss or anxiety or just plain frustration and not being able to go outside. So our social really reflects that. Um, we finally began um, a, our blog um, where we have been writing for the internet. So I said that we had teacher resources. Um, is, if anyone develops teacher resources, you know that they are in their own CPS approved language, which is not necessarily internet ready. So a lot of work has gone into that. Um, our primary audiences have been schools and adult learners. So this was really one of our first experimentations for families to, to write more towards a family um, audience. Um, and then a couple of weeks after we closed, we started doing public programs online. So one of our most popular ones is Art After Work, um, which is very much like a Zoom call like this and people work on their own projects um, and work together. And most recently we have created a playlist, like a music playlist for it. And it's actually just a really nice <laughs> hour of our time. Um, and uh, in May, we are going to pilot um, a few other types of online programs, um, which I'll talk about more later. And then the fourth one, which actually is one that uh, has taken a lot of time to even begin uh, conceptualizing what it looks like, is this Intuit podcast. Now, Intuit has been sort of been talking even before my time about creating a podcast. Now that we were all at home and now that um, our curator and our marketing manager was also, you know, on board to create um, different opportunities for learning or different types of media, this is when we have really begun planning. And, you know, we are several weeks into planning and we're still in this phase of, um, you know, we have all of this wonderful, all of these threads we can follow, like which is the right one that we can sustain over time, like beyond um, into it being closed. So I just kind of threw a lot at, your, at you right now, but that's essentially the thought process. Sounds like, um, it sounds like you guys are doing a lot of really, really great work. Um, so you were just talking about having these initiatives continue after, or at least some of them continue after you reopen. Um, obviously we don't know what it's gonna look like when museums reopen, um, but what do you think is gonna happen to some of these digital initiatives if you had to take a guess when you reopen? Well, I would love to keep um, a lot of them. Uh, so one of the, I will back up and say that one of the most difficult questions that we have been you know grappling with in our engagement team is um, how do we move forward with putting programming online or content online in a way that will be sustainable for us for several months? Um, and because if, if any of you were, had been in conversations about this type of work, especially at the beginning of closure, it was just like this burst of energy. You just put everything on the internet. It's like, oh, now we're at home, so let's start having concerts, you know, every night on the internet. Um, 
so, you know, we really fought that urge to just kind of dump everything. <laughs> um, and for example, art after work, um, even when we open, I think it would be lovely to have a more um, access focused uh, art after work where we um, connect with um, uh, people or groups who are homebound, um, who have mobility issues perhaps. Um, I would love it if our podcast, for example, um, had transcripts every single time we published um, so people could um, read those. Um, I think that uh, any videos that we produce, um, I would love for them to be closed captioned. So I feel like once we have all these, you know, digital assets, making them accessible is like, is I think the way that we should move forward. You know, and in some ways, uh, building in that thinking already is something that uh, has been helpful. Um, even just thinking, you know, why are we producing this teen art workshop for Instagram Live? You know, it's going to go away, you know, at some point. Um, but yeah, those are my initial thoughts. So it sounds like you're using this period of of digital engagement as an opportunity to increase accessibility um, that will that will roll over into the physical space. Does that does that feel accurate? Yeah, I think that that is what definitely has been on my mind, and I will say that it's not something necessarily that as a team we have discussed um, uh, in detail mostly because um, we're still trying to figure out what is actually working. Um, and for example, here I'll, I'll give a great example. Um, when we first started Art After Work Online, um, we weren't sure how many people were gonna show up. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the fact that people did show up and were excited to be together, um, you know, now that is a place where I can think like, oh, how do we make this space grow to be uh, more accessible for a lot of other audiences? And, you know, I wish that we, that our team at Intuit is six full-time people. So half of our team is working on this uh, project. Uh, but also doing, you know, all the other collection stuff, all the other curatorial stuff, all the other communication that has to go out for the institution. Uh, so I feel it's like we have to do it, make sure that it's a, 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 a lift that we can do sustainably. So then, so then we can, you know, keep adding things to it. But that's, you know, that's where we are. <laughs> Um, and do, uh, do we have Carly on the line? Have we figured out how to get her in? Yeah, I'm here. So oh, wonderful. Okay. I acted up for me before. <laughs> of course, right? So, um, so Carly, would you like to, uh, to introduce yourself and say a little bit about, um, what digital engagement looked like at the shed? before uh, the shelter in place and what it looks like now. Sure, um, I'm Carly. I'm the uh, social media and content manager at Shed Aquarium. Um, so I'm managing all of our channels, um, all of our social content, as well as our emails. Um, and as far as content before, or audience engagement before all of this happened, um, our channels were increasing, they were doing well. Um, and we had a very, a very specific way of sharing things out. Um, so, we, you know, we had a certain post limit for each channel every day, um, which is always kept flexible, of course, but at the same time, like, you don't want to overshare, it's where maybe it's less friendly to do so. Um, so, uh, we, we more or less have guidelines set in place for each channel. Um, and the way that monitoring worked, it was split up between me and the um, social specialist who I manage. Um, we're doing every other weekend and then our monitoring hours were business hours so between nine to five and nine to six on our extended hour um you know regular days uh that was when we monitored and then anything after that um unless it was super urgent uh would wait until business hours the next day 
that's been uh, one of the biggest changes is because uh, our audience is a lot more international now. Um, we'll go to, you know, we'll be monitoring into 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night, um, depending on when we stay up. We're not staying up like crazy late to monitor all night, but um, we'll get a lot of, uh, of comments saying, you know, as we're going to bed, good morning. Like, oh, what a great way to start the day with like this penguin post. So it's really weird um, and awesome to see that when we're going to sleep here, some of our audience now is just waking up. Um, so we've changed our monitoring schedule to be uh, uh, business hours during the day. So when we start, um, when we start our day at work, we start monitoring. Um, it's typically our specialist uh, during the week. Um, and then in the evening time, we've actually broken up monitoring between me, the specialist, and um, kind of a big chunk of our marketing team, um, just so that we don't, you know, get burned out ourselves. Um, and then weekends as well, we have that we have that evening schedule set too, which will start, you know, when the day monitor ends, um, which is around five or six, and pretty much goes until you go to sleep. Um, so that's that's been a big change. Uh, in terms of um, how much we share on every channel, we're sharing a lot more. Um, and in terms of like audience engagement we've seen, uh, something that's really interesting is, first of all, there's a lot more of it. We've, you know, more than doubled our following on Instagram and Twitter, which is crazy. Um, but a lot of the responses we're getting are um, quite different than what we were receiving before. We're getting, uh, you know, we'd always have people say, this is cool, or like, this is so cute, and have a lot of really great questions. Um, but now we're seeing a lot of thank yous, and this is keeping me sane, and hello from Germany, and you know, how, you know, then using this as an educational material for um, my kids in Spain. We're getting a lot of like uh, international greetings, a lot of um, gratitude, and um, just a lot of really excited people who are um, really, really engaged. Our engagement rate is definitely kind of skyrocketed. So it sounds like, Carly, some of the ways that you're measuring success of your digital engagement is number of followers, um, number of comments and likes. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about how you're measuring success. And then Paula, because you're at a much smaller institution, uh, I'd love to hear how you're measuring success and maybe you guys can talk to each other about how that's different. Sure, um, so we've always measured success of uh, posts and strategy uh, more in terms of reach and engagement. Um, so there's always those vanity metrics that are really fun to look at, like likes and comments. Um, and it, yeah, likes and comments mainly, and they're great. Um, but we, we really do a deep dive into engagement. So um, how many people of the people this reached are actually engaging with it? Um, which can be interesting. We've in the past had some posts where, you know, the reach will be okay, but the engagement is just crazy, crazy high. Um, and then recently we've, what we've been seeing is um, our reach has definitely gone up. Our impressions have absolutely gone up. Um, and then engagement has been, has been up along with those as well, which is always encouraging to see. Um, right now, it's interesting because uh, in the past, our, our channels had a lot of um, photos that were being shared um, and a little bit less video. We've completely flipped that. Um, our audience is uh, like demanding video. They, they love videos and it makes sense, right? You know, we're stuck. We're all stuck at home. Um, we want to kind of feel like we can go somewhere or like tour the tour an aquarium uh, without actually going there and videos really help do that. Um, plus, you know, penguins especially are just so cute. And so giving people a little bit of a, uh, of a, of a break from um, what's going on in the world with video is, you know, kind of the easiest way to do it. Um, so recently we've still been looking at those reach and engagement met metrics. Um, but we've also been paying attention to, uh, of, of the content we're sharing, what isn't working anymore that has worked for us. Um, so again, recently, you know, we'll, we've been experimenting with sharing certain photos, uh, while some of those really underperform. Um, so that's, that's been something we've been paying attention to. Um, and it's also kind of a balance between um, making sure you're giving your audience what they want, but also making sure that, that uh, you're balancing your own content for yourself too. So if it was up to our audience, we would only be um, sharing videos all the time. Um, <laughs> but we can't do that, unfortunately. I'm trying to figure out how to do that. Because we have so many stories to tell. Um, so anyway, yes, engagement and reach is really yeah. what we're looking at. Um, and making sure those oh, are high and um, comparatively what isn't as high, okay. we then learn from and say, okay, why didn't this work? 
Uh, um, I wish our uh, marketing manager was talking <laughs> because she knows um, about at least the analytics portion a lot better than me, but essentially um, since we weren't doing uh, a ton of digital engagement before, we're only now trying to figure out what those uh, metrics are for us. So at, for, for example, for our online programs, um, of course it's participants, but also it's the level of feedback we receive afterwards. Uh, one of the more special things about Intuit is that the people who engage with us are also very um, forthcoming with their thoughts and ideas of what uh, is working or not working for them. So uh, we have heard from various sources, not only myself, but also like our executive director and um, people in our orbit. So that's actually a really good um, way for us to know um, what is really sticking with people. Um, of course, for social, uh, Annalie, our marketing manager shared that, for example, one of our posts had like a 700% surge um, on just like peer engagement um, on Facebook. So our numbers like have really skyrocketed from where they used to be. Um, and it's, it's, I'm sure it's a combination of people being online, but also people um, perhaps responding just to the way that we have been reaching out to them. Uh, and I really credit Annalie with um, setting that tone for us. Um, moving forward, you know, uh, we have some, like with our Instagram stories that we plan, like we uh, take note of where people drop off for example, like if you ever like on a story and you're like, why are there 20 frames to this story? You know, like at what point do people just like swipe away? And since, you know, we don't have the beautiful technology of video, you know, which is a huge, um, I know that people, our board members love to talk to us about how we should be making videos. Um, <laughs> Uh, then we have to use the, the tools that we have and also the way that those tools uh, measure that engagement, um, you know, on their platform. Uh, so that's kind of the best case scenario we have for now, um, unless I'm forgetting something. But yeah, uh, feedback, personal feedback, how long people engage with us, uh, return people. Here's one other thing I'll say is that um, since Art After Work was on site, obviously it was hyper local. It was, you know, like our circle of people. It's been wonderful to see people come internationally <laughs> into Art After Work. So that has actually been um, kind of a great way to see even how our posts, you know, reach um, across the world. So speaking of how posts reach across the world, um, one post The Shed had that was particularly successful was that uh, delightful penguin video. Um, Carly, could you speak to that video? How did you guys come up with it? Um, and, and what some of the responses have been like? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, those videos uh, just kind of blew up. It's been amazing um, to see that. And uh, like I said, audiences really, really, really want to see more penguins. We'll post, um, we posted, I think like a, oh my gosh, I don't remember what it was yesterday. I think a fly river turtle. And somebody was like, this is great, but where are the penguins? It's like, there's more coming, I promise. Um, yeah. So that, that idea was um, really, I mean, the timing was a huge part of it. Um, it was right at the, be the beginning of all of this, um, which is, you know, crazy because as far as the actual videos themselves of the penguins wandering around, that is actually not something new that we were doing with the penguins. Um, it's just something we had never shared before, and um, this was just kind of the right time for, for um, it to be shared out and the right time for uh, where people were really, you know, really open to and I think excited to seeing it because it was such a nice break from what was going on. Um, but the way that the actual idea came together, like I said, um, the penguin adventures are something that we've been doing at Shed for a long time. Um, they'll let, they'll, you know, obviously while they're watching penguins as, care as caretakers, um, they'll let the penguins kind of explore and wander around um, as part of just their regular enrichment and um, a way for them to explore and, you know. Um, so that was already happening. That idea was kind of already laid out for us. 
Um, but when we found out we were, uh, you know, going to be closing our doors and that everything was going to be changing um, for who knows how long, um, we had to, ch I mean, we had a whole, you know, social plan set for the month. Um, I plan quarterly, so I had, you know, April completely figured out, um, March completely figured out, like everything was done, everything had to flip pretty much overnight. Um, so it was a, probably three hours of the PR team, the animal care team, and the marketing team um, just spitballing ideas and talking about, you know, what, what can we do to um, keep engagement up and to really um, share something fun with our audiences that we think that they'll enjoy. Um, and the idea itself for, you know, recording, actually recording the penguins and sharing them um, on their adventures, uh, that really came from a collaboration between the animal care team, um, the PR team, and the marketing team. Um, it, I don't think any of us expected it to get as big as it has, um, so it's been really exciting to see, but I think that's been the biggest thing to come out of all of this is just so much collaboration. Um, and I mean, even requesting, you know, new, new videos of, uh, of the penguins and um, new assets from our teams, it's all a huge, huge, huge cross-departmental, cross-team collaboration. Um, and, you know, that's, that's such an important part of creating content when you can't actually be together in the office, um, but also such an important learning for the future. It's just, you know, we always know what the animal team, um, the animal care team has story-wise to share. Um, so working with them more has been a great way to say, you know, hey, this is really interesting. Um, even though it seems like a typical part of your day, let's share it out. Um, when we can. So collaboration has been such a huge, huge, huge part of this. Um, and yeah, the audience response has been incredible. Uh, it's been, like I said, just an outpouring of positivity, um, which I, as anybody on social media knows is um, always what you want to see on social media, but not always what you get <laughs> because it's just kind of a, um, it's a mixed bag. But we've just, we've gotten an overwhelming amount of positive, positive responses, um, really thankful responses. Uh, we all, as just a team, are overwhelmed and so happy that we can provide something that is providing as many smiles as it is. I mean, a ton of people are just saying that it makes their day and makes them forget for a second that, you know, they're in an anxious time. And um, that's been really, really uh, just kind of heartwarming and amazing. That's really amazing. And I, I personally really loved that video and, and the first one and then all the subsequent ones. Um, <laughs> speaking of collaboration, um, you spoke about animal care teams. Um, there are a lot of other people who can be involved in digital engagement. Um, obviously, seeing the amazing work Paul is doing, educators. Educators have been some of the people hardest hit in museums by furloughs because a lot of museums um, don't necessarily see how they can be utilizing their educators when there isn't a physical presence. Um, Paula, if you had advice for museums on how they can be taking advantage of their amazing educators for digital engagement, what would what kind of advice would you offer? I think it might be on uh, mute. Yeah. Uh, what I've been hearing uh, from specifically art museums, I will say, is that. Uh, you know, Carly and I are talking a lot about collaborating and my institution literally is now collaborating <laughs> um, across the board for the for digital engagement. But I what I have been hearing from art museums is that there are still so many divisions between the different types of teams, uh, which really, really has created this backlog of how to like really respond in this moment. So uh, my advice is loosen whatever those hierarchies are or loosen who is supposed to be at the table you know like if you only have your director of education at the table with the pr team and the communication team like that is a lost opportunity for other voices at the table if you only have your pr team thinking of all the ideas and then feeding them to education like that is also um not necessarily the way to go one of the biggest lessons from all of this and one of the reasons why from essentially day one that we uh when we had closed into it um we started this team effort is because i wanted every digital asset every digital moment that intuit um created uh to be organic from this team that was getting together um and that is what really has uh, 
and what I hope really will make our efforts sustainable, even when we do have, you know, phased opening. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Um, and then one more question before I open up for Q&A. Um, so we all know that right now museums are hurting financially. Um, what do you guys see? Obviously, this is not necessarily each of your areas of expertise. Um, but what do you guys see might be the relationship between um, keeping museums afloat financially and some of this digital engagement? Um, I can speak to this a little bit too. Um, one thing that we've been really excited to see is um, donations have been, you know, ob obviously it's never going to compare to the amount, the revenue that was coming from guests um, and support coming from that, but it's been amazing to see um, how, how people are showing up to support, um, to support institutions that they really care about. Um, so one thing we've been doing is, uh, in certain posts, um, you know, if it's a if it's a penguin post or an otter post, we even adopt an animal program where you symbolic symbolically adopt um, a sea otter or a beluga or something like that. Um, you get a plush uh, animal in the mail, um, which is very cute, and that that money goes directly into um, Shed's mission and helps us support what we do. You know, both for animals and um, our our work that uh, that feeds into research and and things that are all around the world. Um, so one thing we've been doing is we've been plugging that uh, uh, that adopted animal program into some of our posts. Not every post, because you know we we want our posts to be to be giving to our audiences too. We don't just want to be you know fishing for fishing for donations at every post. Um, but if there is a post where it's relevant and um, you know we think okay this is this is the right time to to put this up, um, we'll in the comments mention. Uh, you know, if you like this and you um, you love penguins as much as we do, uh, here's a great opportunity to adopt an animal. It's a donation. You get a plushie for it. Um, so that's been that's been a great tool. Um, we've also been utilizing our um, our email newsletters as well um, to encourage people to you know in our email email newsletters, it, the content is really entertaining. It's giving a lot to our um, e e news audience um a lot of blog posts a lot of educational tools our youtube series etc um but we will also say like you know if you if you can um because we obviously not everybody can in these times but if people are able um donating now would just you know be a huge support for us and the animals and um shed as a whole um and will allow us to keep you know keep caring for the animals but also to keep providing um more educational materials as well um etc and uh, that that's been great as well. It's just plugging them in, plugging that in emails. Um, we've also been or, uh, encouraging people to become members. Um, obviously, the the membership benefits are not able to be utilized right now, um, but memberships are a huge uh, way to support um, an institution. And so, encouraging people to you know sign up and become a member and be able to use all those amazing benefits as soon as we open um, has been has been a way that we've been uh, tapping to that as well. Uh, so we are definitely likewise doing uh, donor appeals over, you know, our email lists. Um, and I think Deb, our executive director, um, said a little bit about that in the chat. Uh, one uh, story, which I hope she doesn't mind, I mentioned is that, uh, so um, our executive director and our board have been so responsive to making sure that our institution remains financially um, stable and also that staff can remain on payroll um, and that is a commitment that you know they all share um, and you know that has been great to experience that type of leadership uh, Deb <laughs> mentioned uh, yesterday that she was speaking to some donors and uh, you know, they made a gift to the institution and Deb said, thank you so much. This will go directly to paying, you know, payroll. Uh, and this donor said, oh, it's going straight to payroll. Here's an additional X amount of money, you know, to make sure that you can pay payroll. So being, you know, really frank <laughs> where this money is going um, at an institution like ours, has been really important. Um, there have been some social appeals and I know that people have um, donated through that. Uh, but uh, one thing that uh, we have been talking about institutionally is 
uh, let's show the value of Intuit and what we do through what through doing it and e doing it even while we don't have our building. So continually showing the value through our programs, through resources, um, you know, that there's still people working to make sure that, you know, people have something um, to do or to read or a way to engage with artwork. I mean, our institution is truly uh, a place where people, you know, the artists that we show, you know, they've gone through hardships, um, you know, they have lived life and art has been so central. So, you know, we are in a time when people are going through a lot and art being central, I think is important to us. So we have a question from Ann Cullen. Um, and she is saying on the topic of collaboration, have you considered collaboration across institutions to help grow audiences for this new content and resources? Um, so what are some of the cross institutional collaborations you're either seeing or thinking about? Um, sorry, I can speak to that because I um, dropped something in the chat to respond really quick. I think I jumped on it too quick. <laughs> Um, but yeah, uh, I mean, one thing on social that our audience does love, and I worked at Adler Planetarium before Shed, and you know, everybody just loves, no matter the institution, everybody loves to see um, when the museums talk to each other <laughs> on social. Um, I love to see that too, and like I work at them, or I've, I've worked at two of them, so it's just kind of an audience pleaser. Um, yeah, we've, um, we've been talking about possible collaborations to do with um, several institutions. The only problem right now is just because of the shelter in place um, uh, rule, there's there's not as much as we would we can do that we would like to do. So a couple of those ideas we're saving for a little bit down the line, um, you know, if, if we can activate on them. Um, but right now what we've been doing um, and what people also really, really enjoy seeing uh, is simply engaging with each other on social. Um, I know that me and that Shed and Adler got into a back and forth on uh, a post a couple days ago and people were commenting like, oh my god, I love this this like relationship between uh, Adler and Shed, like that was just kind of a, a nice ongoing thing, but it was it was encouraging to see that people liked that. Um, but I, I think collaborating with other institutions for educational um, purposes, it would be amazing. Um, that's something we've, we've definitely just been brainstorming on and hopefully something comes of it um, sooner rather than later. But um, yeah, collaborating with, with other institutions is, is I think something that people always love to see. Yeah, I'm so glad that Annie asked this question because I have also been thinking a lot about collaboration. Um, I have reached out to the Kohler Art Center in Wisconsin. Um, we have a very close relationship with them through some of our teacher programs. Um, and they're still kind of in that uh, planning phase of like, well, how is it going to look, you know, and how some are going to look. So I think getting the right timing with other organizations actually has been a little bit tough. Um, you know, and there I have some uh, colleagues and collaborators in other parts of the country where a time like this could be a, you know, a time when this museum and this museum can get together and sort of create something. But it really is about timing. And at least for us in the first, you know, five or six weeks, it's really been like, what can we actually do and sustain and how can we figure out our own processes for collaborating. I mean, like we have even just uh, begun using different types of tools. Like we just started using Airtable. Like we um, have an editorial calendar, you know, these sorts of things that uh, we just didn't have to have in place in the same way in the past. So yeah, we're, we're building up our internal capacity so we can build, you know, out. Um, I'm really, I'm really excited to hear the focus that both of you have placed, but especially Paula on sustainability. Um, looking at this as an opportunity to build internal capacity that will continue past, um, past the current moment. Um, so another question we have is from Rebecca Boland. And she says, I'm curious to know if slash how museums are planning for summer camps and programs and shifting traditionally in-person programs to virtual. 
Any good resources to anticipate the shift as we begin planning? We're looking at CPS resources to parents for distance learning. Uh, yes, I can <laughs> answer that uh, or begin to answer it. So we do have a summer program, which is a teen internship program. Uh, we don't have summer camps or anything like that. Um, however, now uh, there are several youth groups in Chicago who are talking to each other like uh, the Chicago Learning Exchange. But um, I have reached out to other colleagues who do youth programs and now we are collaborating together to figure out what summer is going to look like and try to figure out how teens will be feeling in June, you know, being in front of their computers, um, if they have a computer, uh, for several months by that point. Uh, so it's very much in flux. I think the feeling is, at least in the teen world, is that we will do remote programs. Um, it just, as one of um, my colleagues said, like, how do you keep it weird on Zoom? You know, like, <laughs> how do you keep that, like, same energy? Um, I, I can't really speak about the younger programs, um, but I, I would, I guess here's what I will say. I will encourage you to ask these questions broadly be, um, on Twitter or wherever it is because people are more than happy to think with you. That's what I will say. Yeah, um, that's a great point. And uh, Paula, we also on, on the like teen program side, um, we've also started switching to, um, to digital for like our teen, I think it was our um, teen council. Um, so that we've already started doing that as well, which has been um, great. But yeah, that's a good point. It's like, how do you keep it weird? How do you keep it super engaging? Um, and uh, I can't, unfortunately, I, I now I wish I had like my um, education, like learning team with me because they know a lot more about, um, about what's going to happen in the summer than I do. Um, all I can speak to is that I, I do know that some of our teen programs have switched um, to a, a digital activation. Um, and they, they've seemed, um, from what I've seen, again, I don't want to speak for the team um, because I, uh, I haven't worked directly with them on this, but um, from what I saw in um, posts about it on, on their channels, um, it seemed uh, like it was really well received. Um, they got really creative with it too. I believe, uh, and don't quote me on this, but from what I saw, it looked like they did kind of like a tour or like a um, like an animal care engagement or something um, thing on Zoom that they were showing um, to the teens. So um, it, there were a lot of, there's a lot of ways to like keep that interesting and, and keep them engaged with your institution without them actually being able to be there. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunities there. Uh, as far as younger summer camps, um, I don't actually know. Um, I'm, I'm sure, you know, the, the whole education, like, learning team is extremely hard at work, um, working on that. I, I know that, you know, we've been in some conversations about what it's going to look like, what's going to happen, um, but I just, yeah, I, I personally don't know at this time. Um, I think that could have been a teaser for when you are talking with your team, your learning team. Maybe you could share a Zoom recording with the CMEC group. <laughs> yeah. Of the, um, of the team, see, uh, Thanks. Yeah, as they're as they're talking about that, if there's a you know with your learning group, if you could share back a, a video recording with uh, of the meeting, just a awesome idea. Awesome, would they be down for? <laughs> At the very least, I can ask if I can ask for tips and <laughs> share those. Uh, I was going to add to that. Uh, I think someone else asked, and as well, you might be getting ready to ask about it. But um, how do you reach people who are not on the internet? Um, so. Uh, I feel like now we're six weeks in, we, it's almost like we have a phase two of our engagement uh, goals. And one of the, the questions that we have been grappling um, is how do we um, reach communities that are not, you know, on online or who also just have no interest in like being on an Instagram live or watching a video. I mean, I think that's actually a, probably a far larger sec section that we want to admit to ourselves. But uh, we're possibly thinking, and, and we have to do, this is the tough part about not being able to just go to your facility 
is figuring out if we can do some sort of sort of art kit or something like that. Maybe like when school is out, like maybe with some of our teacher partners or with another organization. Um, that way um, we can, you know, just like make a little bit of a dent with uh, communities that are just not, I mean, don't want to be in front of Zoom for an hour <laughs> or can't be, you know, in front of Zoom for an hour. Uh, so that's like something that um, there's like energy towards that, that we're building out. That's really exciting to hear. Um, my, uh, my fiance is a teacher on the South side and a lot of her students don't have access to, to the internet or if they do, it's on a phone and it's on um, with data limits. So they're thinking a lot about how do we teach? How do we, you know, call up kids and talk to them about their packets? And an art kit sounds like a, a great way, um, a great way to reach them. Um, so we have a question from Rachel Spella. Um, what advice would you give to students graduating this spring from their museum programs who will be looking for jobs? Um, do you think they should be focusing more on the digital and social space? Um, I just talked to my alumni group from the Brooklyn Museum about this very thing. Uh, I I think I will say we don't all have to become digital people. I'm not. In fact, I have found that I love the internet. I'm extremely on the internet, but that doesn't mean that the museum experience that I love and care about can be translated to the internet. The level of um, learning and engagement that happens in person is something that you just cannot replicate online. And trying to do it is a fool's errand like it, everything that is created for digital media has like it has to be for that medium anyway but i what i will say is that i think that being very very flexible with a variety of skills um including digital inc including knowing how social works like that is going to be so important because you're going to be able to, you are going to have to pivot. You know, when I arrived at Intuit, I was like, oh, great, let's do visitor experience. You know, let's work with our volunteers. Let's make sure we have interactives. And then it's like, oh, now we don't have the building. So then I had to draw from all the other skills I had. So wide skills. Yeah, I would, I would definitely agree with that. Um, I think, uh, I think any, almost any uh, position at a, at a museum or aquarium or just an institution is a, um, a uh, wearing many hats situation. Um, I, I, I would say, I would say that if you, if you don't love doing digital and social, um, I don't know that I would, I would, suggest like squeezing yourself into, you know, a, a square shaped hole if you're like a triangle peg, you know, like in that, in that sense. I, just because it's so, like there is, it's a, it's a demanding role um, and there's a lot that goes into it and there's a lot of creativity and energy that goes into it, um, which is great. But if it's not, if it's not for you and if it's not something you think you'll enjoy, um, I don't know that I would say, you know, because not, not every institution job is going to go digital and like hopefully hopefully we can start actually getting our buildings back pretty soon um but i would say right now one of the best things you might be able to do is reach out to people at institutions who um you know you would where you would like to or, or even institutions that uh maybe even aren't in your uh, in your general area but you want to with them and um, ask people uh, how they got their position um, and just kind of do like an informational interview with them. Um, I think making those connections with places that you would like to work and just at places where you think you could get a great learning experience um, by talking to somebody there. Um, I, I think reaching out to institutions just to see um, what types of roles um, might be, be open for you and you might have interest in um, would be a, a great use of time right now um, because there are so many different 
positions at any institution. Um, and but you know, like Paula said, like being uh, flexible and adaptive in those positions is great. So I think having multiple skills and you know having that digital and social part under your belt um, is great. I think that's always a benefit. Um, but I would say I would say don't close yourself off to other positions um, just because of the time we are in right now. If that makes sense. So speaking of the irreplaceability of the physical experience in a museum um, and seeing that museums in Germany are just starting to open up. So hopefully maybe we will be soon. Um, what are you guys most looking forward to when your institutions open again? I, so I, uh, grew up going to shed um i have dreamed of working at shed like since i was five years old i've literally like my parents would take me every single weekend i i like i'm i was a fan girl of shed like i was really weird in my interviews because i was just like i love shed and it's like they're not gonna hire me because i think i'm a psycho now um but i think one of my favorite parts is literally just just being there i mean there's uh there would be some days where if i felt like i have no ideas right now i'm so burned out you just walk downstairs and you walk around for a second and you learn like 12,000 new things just from a simple walk. Um, and just the amount of like weird things you see the animals doing and like we have a frog fish that likes to just be on the back of one of our sea stars, which is weird. And it's just so fun to see it. So I'm, I'm really excited to actually be able to see the animals again. Um, but I'm also really excited to be able to see um, like families again who are at the aquarium. You know, when I, when I go downstairs to get coffee, my favorite things to do is uh, just see families exploring the aquarium and like one of my favorite things was this family was at the um, I think the otter habitat and this kid was like I'm gonna be a marine biologist when I grow up and the mom was like these are lofty goals at four years old but I'm very I'm very excited about them um, so I really I miss that I miss seeing um, kind of families get as excited about the aquarium as I remember being when I was a kid um, and it's great to see that on social. I love being able to spread that on social and, um, and still spread the excitement, but I miss seeing it in person. Yeah, I think I miss, I miss being able to be in front of works of art, whether it is alone or with other people, you know, there's such a beauty, um, I mean, I love museums, like Carly was saying, I'm like fanatical about them, but um, I, uh, I really love that just kind of being able to be in, an, in a museum in an afternoon and, or at, add into it in an afternoon and just looking at works of art, discovering new things um, and seeing are also the public going through that similar process like that. Like, I really do miss that. Um, and in addition to that, you know, even with art making, it is so wonderful to make art with other people. And it's just been so difficult, you know, unless like your immediate, your family is making art with you, your partner's making art with you, like that, that is an experience that is very hard to replicate um, without, without our building or without the ability to visit, you know, each other. So I think those two things. Speaking on um, seeing art in person, there was a great piece in the New Yorker, I think yesterday, um, What We Miss Without Museums, that talked about the importance of just physically being in front of a painting, um, even, even in places where you can't touch it. Uh, so, so I definitely feel that. Um, and just to, to close up, what are some last pieces of advice that you guys have to, to offer everyone um, about digital engagement? If you have any like last pieces, and then I believe Christine um, has something she wants to do with all of us. Um, I think through all this one, one big learning we've had, um, I, I think the, as a person who manages social and who is uh, engaging with their audience all the time in a digital space, um, you're always listening to and um, paying attention to your audience. But I think right now is a great time to really, really listen to what the audience needs. Um, I, again, if we let our audience dictate everything we posted, it would only be Penguin videos all the time. So we can't, can't do quite that level. But at the same time, we switched a lot of our um, content from 
you know, really, really highly well-produced um, videos from our, our video team, which is, they're incredible. Um, but, you know, we don't, we also can't be asking them for a video every single day. Um, so we've been filling a lot of that space with raw videos from our animal care teams. Um, I think Shed was a little bit stricter on how much, you know, raw, like unproduced video we could do before this. And now it's such a nice peek behind the curtain and saying like, hey, this is, this is an actual step behind the scenes um, for you as an audience to, to check out right now. But stay connected with these animals. Um, so we've really, you know, we've, we've listened to what the audience really needs right now. And a lot of that is video content, cute, cute content, um, and educational content, which we've always provided. Um, but there's a real hunger right now for just um, ed educational material that's fun, that can both be used for families and kids, and that can just educate people who are, you know, stuck on their couch or stuck inside and, you know, just bored. Um, so that's been, that's, that's been a big learning for us is just uh, listening to what our audience needs and paying attention and making sure we're um, helping them where they need it. Uh, I would say that uh, as trying not to feel like it's a competition, <laughs> because I think that uh, in the digital space, everything feels flattened in some way. It's like my post and the Shed's post and, you know, the field museum posts something. So it feels very much like we're all somehow competing. Uh, so there's that. I think the other thing is really imagining how people are going to experience your content. I mean, like early on in this crisis, uh, you know, there were such a cacophony of like, blah, 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 art workshop, a thousand people have died, uh, the borders have closed, you know, so like just being so sensitive to what is truly happening and not be in this space of like our content, we're pushing out our content, our content. And that can be really difficult because as museum workers, we have so many different types of demands, you know, demands from um, maybe other colleagues, uh, internal staff demands, demands from board members perhaps. So all of these pressures to like perform in a certain way. Um, but like being so, tr just try to remain uh, calm and lucid about truly what are we trying to achieve here? You know, besides putting out just, you know, diarrhea of stuff. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, we're ultimately here to serve our communities and that's a really good reminder. Um, so before I pass this off to Christine, I just wanted to say that we are planning to share the, out this recording to the Chicago Museum Exhibitors Group email list. Um, if you're not on the email list, you can get on the email list um, by filling out the form at the link that I just put in the chat. Um, and with that, uh, thank you, Paula and uh, Carly so much. And I'm going to pass it over to Christine.